Hello and welcome to the Slackware Arm vlog. At the time of creating this video, it's March 2024, and the last time that I refreshed the Slackware ARCH64 installers for the current branch, the development branch, was December 2023. So I thought it was about time that I refreshed those images, uh, particularly because there's been so much uh, development since that since the previous release. So the way it works with the installers is you download the installer image and that single image you then copy onto an SD card and you boot it. And that contains the Slackware installer and all of the Slackware media, so all, all of the packages. It's very similar to the way that you download a DVD image and boot it and install off the DVD. So you don't need to set up a local FTP or NFS server, or you don't need to install it over the internet or anything like that. You, you can have a completely offline installation because it just makes it a heck of a lot easier. So I've already tested the installation media on the Honeycomb LX2 and on the Rock Pro 64. So in this video, I thought we conduct the installation of Slackware ARCH64 using my freshly cleaned up DEC VT320 that you may have seen in a previous video. It was absolutely filthy. I've since dismantled it, cleaned it on the inside, and actually it wasn't too bad on the inside, believe it or not. It has like a, it had a metal grill um, on the inside that covered the, um, the, the sort of the, the slats for the to dispense uh, to disperse the heat um so actually it wasn't too dirty on the inside although th there was something I don't know I don't know the name of it it was connected to the CRT screen and it was heavily corroded but nonetheless it still works fine um, so let me take you and have a look at it okay so here it is I've cleaned every single key um, top and sides I've done as well as I can as well as I can really I use baby wipes and got a screwdriver and just cleaned everything um, you know push the, use the screwdriver to push the baby wipe in and cleaned it all so I've done a pretty good job of that uh, and also underneath I've given it a nice good clean there uh, over the top around the back and sides it sounds like giving it a haircut doesn't it um, so you can see here giving it a good nice clean um, so it's all yeah, it's all good. One of you guys had mentioned that on the uh, in the comments on the previous video so I didn't know deck actually had a base in Reading. So yeah, thank you for that comment I didn't realize that deck had a base a huge base uh, in Reading and Reading's very close to um, here It's about 45 minutes away something like that um, So I might go and have a look at that because uh, I do like old vintage equipment uh, <laughs> although actually I binned a load of it in e-waste many years ago and I kind of regret that I had I had a Sun Ultra 5, a Sun Ultra 1, a Spark Station 20 which is also Sun I had a deck and I had an Indi I did have a deck alpha but I sent that to one of the Slackware community guys back in the mid 2000s for the alpha Slackware ports that he was working on then I also had an SGI uh, an Indigo, I forgot what it was now, it's a big purple thing. So I also had that which ran Irix. I never intended on trying to get Slackware onto that thing. I used to enjoy my vintage Unix boxes. So thank you for posting that. I had no idea that uh, deck were in Reading. This one was actually manufactured in Hong Kong. Um, and you can see the manufacturing date there. It's actually made in 1990. So it's not as old as I originally thought that it was because I was basing my, um, I was basing its age off of the date on the firmware but you can clearly see here it was actually manufactured in 1990 so not quite as old as I'd originally thought but you can see here on the left it has uh, a printer a port for a printer has a port for this this one on the right hand side uh, that's the printer port this one on the right hand side is um, a, I think it's a deck proprietary connector I have looked into this um, and I decided that I didn't need to use that and this is just a standard RS-232, and I can't remember how many pins again it is, um, 24 pin? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, but you can see what I've done here. I've got a uh, 24 or whatever the pin <laughs> number of pins it is, um, to nine pin connector here. And then I have a null modem cable, which uh, I've got then connected into a USB to uh serial adapter so i've got that running down here and then i have it connected into a usb to serial adapter which is this one uh you can see where is it that that uh, usb to serial adapter is this gray one here on the top so that's the raspberry pi 4 here and that's the uh, adapter there so 
Um, yeah, so that's how I've connected it to the Raspberry Pi at the moment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this thing is, because some of you probably have absolutely no idea what this is. So this is the DEC VT320. VT stands for Video Terminal. Back in the olden days, the way that you connected to Unix boxes was over what's called a teletype, a teletype machine. So if you look, um, and by the way, I don't know why this is going yellow. It must be something to do with the phosphorus in here. It's actually white, although it's kind of like creamy colored really, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it, it's, not, it's not that it's yellow. It's just that it's just the way it interacts with the camera, but it is actually a single, um, it, it is monochrome. This is a monochrome uh, unit. There are other versions of this unit, which I think are, um, there's certainly an orange colored version and maybe another one as well, I'm not sure. But this one is just purely white. It just, for some reason, ends up looking yellow or parts of the screen look yellow. I've got no idea why. Um, if you guys do, let me know, because I have absolutely no idea. I guess it's just the way it interacts with the camera. I don't know. Anyway, so originally you connected these, these big mainframe boxes uh, over what's called a teletype. So that's what TTY means. Eventually, those teletype machines were replaced with these, which were with these video terminals in around the 70s. In the video description below, you'll find a link um, to a very technical document that explains the TTY subsystem in Unix and Linux. It provides a little bit of background about the history of the teletype machine and the video terminal machines like the one we're looking at in this video. As I said, it is highly technical, but it's also very interesting. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, check it out. It's a really good read. So in the 70s, they replaced the teletype machines with these solid state video terminals, VT. Some of you are probably familiar with seeing VT220 or VT100. If you've ever really looked into Linux and you looked at the config files or, or Unix as well, you've probably seen at least VT100 or VT220. Those are the most common. Um, but this is a VT320 and it, it, this has additional features over the VT220. If you want to learn more about this, um, somebody created a sort of reasonably short video on YouTube, which I'll include here in the corner. Um, check that video out. He's connected his VT320 using a wireless modem. But for me, I've just gone old school and uh, using um, direct cables. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I've done there in a minute. But basically, these video terminals were used to access uh, Unix boxes, at least, you know, in, in my era. And this particular one came from university. And we had these in the library at university to connect to the library book system. And this one came from the network administrator who I befriended at university because I was interested in Unix. And he let me play around with some of their Unix boxes there. And eventually when they were uh, decommissioning a load of kits, including the Spark Station 20 that I mentioned previously, he provided me uh, a Spark Station 20 and an absolutely enormous monitor that I could barely carry. It was, it was like a 21 inch mon CRT monitor and it weighed an absolute ton. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he gave me that and then gave me this VT320 to connect uh, to it as well. So as I said, I've now cleaned it all up again, got it working and I now have it connected to the Raspberry Pi. So this is not a personal computer. It is what's called a dumb terminal. So when you um, are using putty or you know, Xterm or um, console or whatever. Those are a software simulation of one of these things here. And this has no fans in it. It doesn't have any storage. It has a little, well, it has some storage um, because you can save, if you look here, you can actually save the settings. So the local storage is simply used to save the settings that you can configure in here. And there, there's not a huge amount to configure. Um, on this one, you actually have to, there is a distinction between the return key and the enter key. So if you press return, it doesn't do anything. Uh, and in fact, it tells you press enter to take the action. So you press enter there and you can configure the, um, the, the basically the way it acts on the screen. So in this section of the configuration, you can configure how it behaves on screen. And you'll see this 80 columns here. I'll return to this later. And there are a few other options. You've got auto scroll, which is really nice. And I'll show you that in operation in a few minutes. Um, you can also change this. So you can make it so that, well, you can invert the display. And I really don't like that. So that's that. And a few other options to control how it displays, which is useful when you're using bulletin boards or certain types of software. And then you press F3. And then oh, that leaves the menu. So you press it again. 
um, you've got a few other options as well. So in this case, I have set it to, oh, why is it BT300, hold on. Yeah, that's the default. Uh, and then you can select the ID here. So you can see it's on VT320. I can set it to 100, 102, and then VT220, and then finally VT320. So I'm going to leave mine configured as VT320. Um, you can change a few of the other options. Uh, and then the only other one of, ah, whoops. Oh, yeah. So some of the keys um, are slightly sticky. <laughs> I guess it's got some muck under it, I don't know. I basically gave it a cosmetic cleanup. I haven't, I didn't dare dismantle this in case it fell to pieces and I didn't know how to put it back together again. Um, so let's go back. So uh, where are we, com? Yeah, ah, yeah, you see, look, it's a sticky key. <laughs> right, okay, so yeah, so the com, this is what I've uh, been playing around with. So you can, um, there are only a few options on the com setup. So you've got uh, the max, you've got 75, BPS or, or board bits per second. So that's the slowest it goes, which would be absolutely unusable. Then you've got 110. I mean, these are completely unusable. Whoa, ah, stop. Okay, I find if you, if you just if you just press it on the corner, it's all right. So 19.2K is the fastest transmission speed that it supports. If any of you guys used the internet back in the early to mid 90s, you'll know just how slow that board rate is. However, as the guy mentioned in his a VT320 video, there is something quite soothing and relaxing about having nothing on the screen but what you're currently working on. Um, it's really, you know, he, he mentions, I, I found it quite funny initially that he said it was, he's, he was kind of brought him to his Zen or something like that. And I found that quite funny, but actually there really is something quite soothing and relaxing when you just have a single application that you're interacting with rather than having all these different icons on the screen and lots of window furniture, um, particularly with the smooth scrolling on the VT320, as I'll show you, it, it, is, it is remarkably calming. Hmm. Okay, so there's a few other different options there. Uh, oh, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, you can set up a few other things, but uh, that's basically it, really. Uh, that, that's, all, that's all that's particularly interesting. I have played around with all of the options in here. There are some oddities that I've observed, and I don't know how to fix them. If any of you guys do, uh, let me know in the comments or drop me an email to moses at slackware.com. All right, so here we are. We are connected to the Raspberry Pi using our... Uh, null modem to USB to serial adapter that, as you can probably still see, is plugged into the Raspberry Pi's USB 3 port. So we, this is us here, we're going to type W, and there, there we are, and you can see that our line is TTY USB 0, so that's this here, that's the uh, USB to serial adapter. Then you've got TTY 1, who's TTY 1? This is TTY 1, this is the Raspberry Pi's local keyboard. So we're using the Linux virtual console here. So if I press W, you can see that was just me. That was me that just pressed W there on the keyboard. And this is TTY1. So this is teletype number one. But who's TTYS1? TTYS1 is this one over here. And this root user here is logged in through the TTYS1 serial line. Okay. So what is that? So we know that TTY USB 0 is our VT320. TTY 1 is the Linux virtual console, which is the, you know, the actual keyboard and monitor that's connected to the Raspberry Pi. And TTY S1 is actually, well, okay, what we're doing here is I've SSH'd from this laptop into this laptop over here, which is one of the ones I use for uh, as, as one of the build machines for Slackware ARP64. This runs the cross compiler, what's well, one of the x86-64 machines that run a cross compiler. Um, and this, uh, so I've SSH from the laptop on the desk into this one here, because this is the one that's actually connected to the Raspberry Pi. So this one is, has a US, another USB to serial adapter, but this one is, oh, the wires are crossed up, I think. Or is it that one? Oh, no, it's, yeah, the wires are crossed over. Okay, never mind. Anyway, so this, so this wire here, which is connected to the serial pins, which are down here 
on the, well, as you look at it, on the left at the bottom. Okay, now that's USB to serial adapter will allow us to observe the Raspberry Pi as it boots. So when we boot, reboot the Raspberry Pi, you'll be able to see it booting on the uh, HDMI, HDMI connected monitor, but you'll also be able to see it booting over the serial console. One of the things that I originally tried to do was to connect the VT320 directly to the, uh, um, the, 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 the serial pins on the Raspberry Pi board so that on the VT320 I could observe and interact with it um, from the moment that it's booted. However, that involved purchasing yet another piece of hardware. Admittedly, it wasn't particularly expensive. I think it was a few pounds, a few dollars or something. Um, but it, nonetheless, it meant buying some, an extra piece of hardware, which I didn't really need to do. Um, but, what, but you can buy them off, um, off, off Amazon and various other places. Because as far as I remember, the uh, standard serial runs on 12 volts, but the Raspberry Pi and all of the other ARM boards run on 3.3 volts or some, something around that. So you can't connect the two. You have to have an adapter that aligns the voltages. So you can buy one of these adapters and I could have had the VT320 connected directly to those serial pins. But as I said, I just didn't want to spend the extra money on, on something that really I didn't need. So what I've got here is I've got the, uh, the VT320 connected to the Raspberry Pi uh, using a USB to serial adapter. I can only access the Raspberry Pi from the VT320 when the OS has booted and it's brought up a Getty on the, US, uh, on the TTY USB zero interface. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. You don't need, don't need to know any of this to install Slackware. This is not the standard Slackware installation route for a Raspberry Pi at all. If you want to know what that is, just go to arm.slackware.com, click on the installation guides, and then you'll, and then just walk through the documentation uh, and you'll see how to do that. This is just me going back to when I was 18 years old, playing around with Unix and having some fun, having a trip down memory lane. I'll show you how I've set this up on the Raspberry Pi. So if you look at uh, USB zero. So as you'll see, there's, there's no mouse interaction. There is no mouse for this at all. So it's all purely uh, typing on the keyboard. So the way I've set it up, um, oh, should that tell you what? Let's, uh, let's make it easier to see. Uh, S1. And I'll show you, so all, the, all of the control functions work. So if I press, look, if I press uh, control, which is that one there, and L to clear the screen. So you'll see, watch. So everything, all of that stuff works. There are a few issues here, which I'll show you in a minute, but, uh, and I don't know how to resolve them, but uh, in most cases, it's, it's, it's quite good. Okay, so, so you'll see. So this is how I've configured it in the init tab. So init tab is the is init's configuration file, and init is what brings up the Unix system. So you can see here that uh, it's opening up a, a TTY. So these are the two board rates I've got it configured as, and that's the line it's connected to, TTY USB 0, and VT320 is the terminal ID. So this is, of course, a VT320, so I've aligned it like that, so that when you log in to the box, this is the terminal setting well, basically, this is aligned with the with the terminal that's actually connected to it. I'm going to write the Slackware Arch64 installer onto the SD card and reboot it into the installer. So I think I've already got uh, HD Devel. Some of the keys are a bit, a little bit sticky. Arm Slack Distrib uh, platform Slackware platform uh, Arch64 installer. Oh yeah, bootware installer AIO dot slash tools SA64 boom. Yes. As I said previously, if you want to install Slackware on your Raspberry Pi, follow the installation guides. The installation guides walk you through how to download the um, SD card image that you'll write to your SD card and everything else that you need. What I'm doing here is using a local script to detect which hardware model it is, in this case it's a Raspberry Pi, and then write the appropriate Slackware installer image to the SD card that is in uh, currently mounted inside of the Raspberry Pi. This is just one of the tools that I use to uh, aid development of Slackware ARCH64. Okay, so the Slackware installer has written to the 
micro SD card. So we're gonna now press enter. But as soon as I press enter, the machine will reboot. And at which point it, we will lose access to the Raspberry Pi through the VT320. Because as I said, the this access is contingent upon the OS. Whereas if we had connected this VT320 to the serial pins of the Raspberry Pi, then we would maintain access to the Raspberry Pi. But uh, because this uh, laptop is SSH'd into the machine that is connected to the serial port of the Raspberry Pi, we'll be able to monitor the progress of the Raspberry Pi as it boots into the Stackware installer on here. And by the way, the reason we've SSH'd into that machine is simply because the um, uh, because this serial cable just isn't long enough. <laughs> I could have used an extender, I suppose, but th that's where that's the machine that it's normally connected into for remote access. And of course, we'll also be able to monitor it from the um, the uh, virtual the Linux virtual console on this screen here. So let's uh, press enter, and we will watch the machine reboot. So you can see here over the serial console that the machine has started to reboot. Uh, maybe if I move that. Well, no, okay, um, but you can see here as well the Raspberry Pi. Well, the lighting is not great here because of the reflection, but you can see that the Raspberry Pi here uh, is, is uh, surfacing the video on the HDMI connected monitor here. So we'll see that booting there. Oh, so we're currently in the bootloader and it's just loading the installer image into RAM, as you can see here. So we'll be able to follow it. Actually, I can, can I do that? Oh yeah, there we go. So there you go. So you'll see kind of a little bit wonky. Let's try not to drop the laptop on the floor. Um, so yeah, you'll see here again, because sorry, sorry about the uh, reflection, but there's nothing I can do about that really. Here on the laptop here, we're following the boot sequence over the serial cable. And here we're observing it over the Linux frame buffer on the HDMI monitor. Now, What's going to happen is this this is going to happen here, and then in a moment you'll see, it should do anyway, you'll see, let's put that back here now. You should see a login prompt pop up. Oh, here we go. Welcome to Slackware. Okay, yeah. So this is one of the weird things here, and I don't know what is going on. I've looked into this a little bit on YouTube and found other people have exactly the same issue here. I don't know what it is. It isn't corruption on the, it's not a bad serial cable or anything like that. I don't know what it is. It's probably just some control character that this thing can't render. I have played around with various settings and I've been unable to fix this. I just don't know what it is. But anyway, so if we do that, um, it, if I, well, actually, when I put this on a lower terminal set, in fact, actually, I'll tell you what, let's, let's, let me show you that. Because that, it did, it does work slight, ah, stop it. It does, oh, hold on. <laughs> It does work slightly better on 9600. So let's try that. I need to fix this enter key. It's going to drive me crazy. Come on. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like really lightly touching it. Okay. So let's try that. If I press enter. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because it's. I think I might have hard coded it actually. Hang on. Hold on. Try resetting it. Hang on, let me just see. It, it, it works fine at 1900. Um, let's see. Oh, hang on. Yes, actually, cat. So I'm going to tell init to reload its config and see if that makes any difference. It might not, actually. Hold on. So wait a minute. PS wax you grab USB. There it is. So kill dash nine seven six six. There we go. No, that made it worse. <laughs> right. Okay. Fine. So, uh, hold on. Okay. Fine. Let's just leave it as it was then. Nine thousand six hundred. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Yes, kill, kill, seven, seven, eight. All right. 
Okay, fine. We have, yeah. So on the Rock Pro 64, where I tested this first, it didn't do this, so I don't know. Um, but what we need to do, we need to log in as root. Password, it doesn't have a password. So some of the text, as you can see there, is garbled. Again, I don't know what this is, but it's this is not the only VT320 that does this. Um, I don't record any of these issues when I was connected to the Sun boxes, but that was over 20 years ago. One of the things I initially noticed as I first when I first ran through the Slackware installation is that parts of the installation process get stuck. In particular, if you do load keys, say UK and press enter, it just hangs forever. We don't have S-Trace or any of the debugging tools within the installer, so I don't know why it's stuck. I have a feeling as to why and where it's stuck, but there's nothing I can do about that, apart from control and see it. Uh, I've tried fiddling around with the settings and it doesn't work. Um, of course, loading a key, loading a key map here is completely pointless anyway because it, the the key map is for this for the virtual console. It is not for the serial connection, so it doesn't make any sense anyway. Um, so what we, I, I just had this idea that if I SSH'd into the installer, it might work, and guess what? It does. <laughs> so. Um, so if we do that, if we SSH into the installer, there is no password. You can set a password on the Slackware installer using the Linux command line, um, but by default there isn't one. So we've logged in over the serial line, then we've SSH'd into the installer, and now we're going to run the setup. Now, uh, if you were installing Slackware for the first time, you'd need to configure... Oh yeah, you can see that really. Hold on, what's the terminal setting here? Ah, Linux, okay. Well, that needs to be VT320. VT320. Oh, there we go, look. Oh, okay, 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 looks slightly better. But as you can see, yeah, some of it's it's just mangled, but okay. Um, if we if we actually look here and use this one where it's not mangled, um, fdisk flash L, you'll see that we have the SDA here, which is the uh, SSD drive. And then the MMC BLK, that's the SD card. So this is where the Slackware slash boot partition will reside. And also on the Slackware installer, it also contains this partition here, the 5.3 gig partition contains the Slackware installation media. So ordinarily we need to configure our file systems and the Slackware installation guide walks you through that. But in this case, we don't need to because I've already got them because this was a fully functioning um, installation of Slackware. So I think I made a note of what I need to do. Yeah, so I've set the terminal correctly, VT320, and now we'll run the Slackware setup. Oh, okay. Wait a sec, that's not looking, hold on. No, that's even worse. So earlier, I wonder if I had it set to VT320. Set that to VT320. You can see it's slightly better if I set it to VT220. So let's leave it like that. Okay, so let's, uh, we don't need to map the keys. Um, let's just go straight to add swap. Yep, uh, yep, that's fine. Swap space detected, great. Uh, we're gonna pick our root file system, format it. We'll use X4, okay. All right. Okay, yeah, thank goodness that the return key isn't sticky. <laughs> it's only the enter key, otherwise I'd be gone mad by now. So this screen tells us that it's located the Slackware packages on that 5.3 gig partition on the SD card. And would we like to install our packages from there? Well, by golly, we would. So let's press enter. 
We'll select all of the packages and do a full installation of Slackware because that is the recommended default, although you don't have to, of course. So we'll press enter and we'll press enter again. So Slackware will now begin to install and this will take probably about 45 minutes or something. I haven't timed it for quite a while. So we'll pick this back up when it's installed. Okay, so the installation is just finishing up. So the bootloader is being configured. On the Raspberry Pi, it uses U-Boot. It's now synchronizing the operating system initial RAM disk, which is the small environment that brings up the operating system. It's now asking us to remove the Slackware installer from the SD card because it is now superfluous to requirements. So yes, we'll remove it. It will then update the font database. Okay, mouse configuration. Yeah, we will configure a mouse. We'll load GPM. Okay, yeah. So this one's called Muttley. Muttley um, dot slack where dot com okay now we don't need a vlan uh we'll use network manager uh it looks good okay i'm going to start rpc because i always use it for nfs where is it uh there it is so you'll see there's a little bit of corruption on the screen so what i'm going to do is press Control and l to signal a redraw there we go done although did i actually deselect actually i never selected it did i so press spacebar to select it there we go you can see it's now selected rpc so that's done press enter uh custom console fonts yes i would actually because the console fonts are for the linux virtual console and i do want so at the moment you can see uh that they're quite small so that's the default um if I was to press enter on here, which I could do, this will bring up the Slackware. This is, when you install Slackware ordinarily on a Raspberry Pi or any of the other machines, uh, you, you do it through the keyboard and the monitor, and we automatically select a large font. Um, but, but on a fresh installation, you do have to configure it. So I'll press yes, and I'll press T to jump down to the T section, and then I'll just scroll down with the next, screen button or page down as it would be called on a uh, normal machine earth 732b that's the one to press enter press one okay okay then i need to press select the time zone so i'll just scroll down to uh london press enter oh yeah whatever i don't care about that I'll select XFCE as the window manager because KDE is still crashing unless you use the Raspberry Pi's own kernel. Uh, so we'll press that and we'll type ourselves a root password. Okay. We'll press enter, press E to exit, and then we'll pick a reboot because we, oh, hang on, reboot's the default. So we'll press enter on reboot will now be disconnected again on the VT320, but we can once again observe the Raspberry Pi booting over the serial console. Uh, and also, of course, we'll see it booting on the uh, HDMI monitor as well. You can observe the boot over the serial console and also uh, over the HDMI monitor. Okay. Again, it takes slightly longer on the first boot of Slackware because it has to configure the SSH keys and set up a couple of other things, but there we go. So it's booted already. That's pretty fast, huh? Right, I saved the init tab to save me having to redo this. So if we do this, etc. init tab, and then the one that we saved, you'll see that the line that, this is the line here um, do we have GPM loaded? Oh yeah, we do. So this is the line here that uh, brings up the TTY on the 
USB to serial adapter. So by default with the OS, we don't automatically configure this. In the Slackware installer, I recently modified the Slackware ARM installer so that it did automatically bring it up if it detected it. But that's just something I, I hacked into the installer um, for fun for myself and just left it there <laughs> for you guys if you ever find it. But this isn't something I would add into the operating system. Oops, didn't mean to paste that in. Um, but what I'm gonna do, so let's just update the init tab here on the system and just whack, I'll just stick it at the end here to make it easier. If you don't know how this, how I just did that, by the way, um, all you do is you just hit the middle button like you do in X and like there you go, look. And then that simply pastes GPM's clipboard here. So of course what I'll do now is I'll just delete those extra lines. What we'll do now is if we go over to the serial console here, uh, just because of the orientation, it's easier to show you. So if we if we do, oops, if we do, okay. So if we cat etc. in it tab, it's kind of hard reaching over here. So this is the line at the bottom that we've added there. Okay, that one. So what we're going to do, but as you can see, there's no uh, there's no TTY here. So what we're going to do, if we cause init to reprocess its configuration file, which is etc. slash init tab kill all, kill all, dash hup for hang up signal, in it, and watch this, you press enter, boom, there we go, and then, oh, the only thing, okay, so I'll show you this won't work, so if I log in as root, which it shouldn't do anyway, no, right, I typed in the, whoops, I've typed in the correct password, but it won't let me log in, that's because the login program, which is what's running here, the slash bin slash login program is what provides this login prompt. The login access is controlled. Well, I'll load into an editor actually. Oops. Okay. Okay. Um, in it. Oh, no, uh, sorry. It's called, it's called secure TTY like that. So I can't spell it. It's really hard reaching over like this. Secure TTY. Um, this file defines which devices root can log in on. So you'll see. Uh, the local consoles, the Linux virtual consoles, TTY 1 through 6. You've got TTYS 0. What we'll do is we'll add TT, TTY USB 0, save the file, and then when we log in again, I don't think we need to uh, reload. We might do actually, let's see. Root. We've now been able to log in. Um, uh, what date is it? Great. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do now is add myself a plebeian user, add my mosaic user here. Okay, okay. I've now created myself a pleb user. I could also log in as that user now through the serial console here. H top, so we can see H top there. So, actually, is the smooth scrolling still enabled? Let me see. Oh, no, it's not. It's disabled. Ah, oh. okay, it must have been. There we go. Smooth scroll, right. Okay, now you can see smooth scroll in action. Right, so if we, if we run PS again. Uh, right, now, by the way, if you guys don't know about reverse eye search, you really should. So reverse eye search, instead of pressing the up key like this, as you can, so you can press the up arrow to scroll through the shell history, right? You're probably familiar with that. But if, if, you, if you don't know about the reverse eye search, right. okay, so if you don't know about reverse eye search, you do control and R, so there's the control key, and there's R, like that, do that, and you'll see now it says reverse eye search. So what you can start typing in is, uh, for example, P S, okay? And then it'll show you the history. So in my case, there's only three things in the history. Um, but then what you can do, so actually I'll show you. So if we do, if we control C that, just do P S dash F E, right? So have a different, uh, you can see the smooth scrolling, although that's clearly so some of the character sets have basically caused the um, VT320 to kind of uh, create two distinct um, parts of the screen. So if I so if I do Control and L, I wonder. Oh, okay, there we go. It's cleaned it. 
Okay, so now if we do control R again, okay, okay, you get reverse eye search. If I type in PS, PS, like that, it shows you PS dash FE. Then if I do control R again, like this, look, now you've got the other option because I, earlier I typed PS will wax you. So you can do control and R and just cycle through these, right? So you can press enter on that and then you get this nice smooth scrolling, but yeah, there's something in the, uh, in the output here, which has caused the VT320 to basically block out this part of the screen. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, okay, so that is the VT320. Now, just to briefly test the graphics on the Raspberry Pi, let's switch over to another virtual console. Okay, so in this case, I just pressed Alt on, on and then the arrow key. Okay, so I'll log in as my pleb user that I created over the serial console type start x and xfce will load it's actually pretty fast there we go so xfce has loaded looks good to me i'll load up the web browser okay well i hope you've enjoyed this video as much as i have uh, installing slackware through a deck vt320 I think what I'll do now is play around with it a little bit more and try and work through some of the quirks that we saw around the uh, character display. There must be some way of fixing it, I just don't know what it is yet. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you have you can like and subscribe to the channel um, but more importantly uh, you can donate as well if that's something you're able to do. Basically the donations go to paying for the electricity to run the build machines and all of the other infrastructure stuff. Uh, buying new hardware and replacing broken hardware. And that leaves me with one final thing to do.